Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is November 18th, 2022. This is part six of my series called The Obedience of Faith. The title of this one is Despising Our Inheritance. And I plan to cover Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 today. So let's get right into it. We'll start reading in Romans 8 at the very end of that chapter as we head into chapter 9. The last three verses say, In all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then chapter 9 begins. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. What? What has just happened? It's like Paul suddenly is making a 180 degree U-turn. He's just finished praising the glories of God and how Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But here in verse 2 of 9, he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed <clears throat> and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the placement as sons the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. <clears throat> so it seems very strange, and it seems out of context. And But we'll continue going and, and just try to discern what Paul is doing and saying here. But I want to focus here on verse 5, where he says that Christ came from the Israelites in the flesh. And then right after that, he says, who is God over all? So Paul says Christ is God. We all need to understand that. Verse 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Now there is a statement <clears throat> that's uh, hard to understand and hard to comprehend. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. We are going to... Uh, get more into that later. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his seed. But through Isaac shall your seed or your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau 
I hate it. So Jacob and Esau were the two sons of Isaac and Rebekah. This quote, Jacob I love but Esau I hated, is in chapter 1, at the beginning of chapter 1, of the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. And so I looked, I looked up a verse in Genesis. We'll go to Genesis chapter 25, and specifically... Uh, I want to look at verse 34. So go to Genesis 25. And then thirty-four. Well, first I'll go to 23, where God speaks to Rebekah. <clears throat> Rebekah conceived, and then verse 22 says, The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of I am, and I am said to her, Two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. <clears throat> Jacob means he who takes by the heel, or it also could mean he cheats. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter and a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once... When Jacob was, stew, was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom, and Edom sounds like the Hebrew word for red. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. And then this is the very last line of Genesis 25. It says, Thus Esau despised his birthright. Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. I think this is why. Esau, Esau despised his birthright. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Is it possible for us to despise our birthright? Well, what is our birthright? Let's go to the book of John, chapter 1. And we'll read 9 through 13. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Speaking of Jesus, of course. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, 
nor of the will of man, but of God. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It doesn't say that you immediately become a child of God once you believe in Jesus. And unfortunately, that's what the church teaches. In John chapter 3, Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. And he said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then a little later he, to Nicodemus, he said, unless you are born of the Spirit, which is to be born of God, and of water, born of water, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's two things. We have to be born of God. We have to receive the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. We have to receive the earnest of the Holy Spirit in us. But then we have to be born of water. So now, <clears throat> that helps to explain John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We can become a child of God by being born of water now. So now let's go back to Romans. And... Uh, We'll just start at where we left off at verse 14 in chapter 9. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? In other words, God has created all of us from clay. He makes us of the dust of the ground. And he makes some of us for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. And it sounds like, well, no use trying, is there? If we're just made a certain way, nothing I can do about it. That's what it sounds like. But let's look at a scripture that tells us a little bit more about this. This is 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. And we're going to go down to verse 20. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. In a great house. He's talking about God's house. In God's house, there are vessels of gold and silver and wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every 
good work. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, how do we cleanse ourselves? With the water of the word. Now let's go back now to Romans. So, verse 21 says, Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. There is a reason why God allows evil in the world. There is a reason why God allowed Satan to be in the Garden of Eden. The reason is so that his people, his chosen people, his elect, his kodeshim, his overcomers, would learn to discern good and evil and to choose the good. We must learn to discern good and evil and choose the good then we will be fit for honorable use. But does every Christian do that? Does every, everyone who names the name of Christ, who believes in Christ, who receives the earnest of the Holy Spirit, does everyone do that? If you go to 2 Timothy Immediately after he says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. He then says this, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies, you know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. We are in a cauldron. We are in a pressure cooker. And we are in a world of extreme evil. But we are called to patiently endure evil. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. So, this is what Christians are called to do if they want to be honorable vessels in God's house. And then Paul moves to a prophetic word. This is verse 25, 9.25. As indeed God says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. Paul now is speaking of the word going out to the Gentiles. In the book of Hosea, in chapter 1, God commanded Hosea to marry a harlot. And then, after they married, they had three children that all had prophetic names. This particular one 
was the third child. And we'll go ahead and read some of this out of uh, Hosea. Hosea was the last prophet that spoke to the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, before Israel was captured by Assyria. And when Assyria captured Israel, they dispersed them throughout the earth, throughout their kingdom. And many of them went north into the Caucasus Mountains, and then from there west into Europe and even Rome. So Paul now is, is going to the book of Hosea to give prophetic insight as to what Hosea meant. So, Hosea's wife, verse 8, 1, 8, when she had weaned no mercy, that was her second child, she conceived and bore a son. And I am said, call his name not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. God at this time, rejects the nation, the northern nation of Israel and says that they are not my people. Verse 10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. So this is what Paul quotes. And so, in the places that Paul went, because Paul was called as an apostle to the Gentiles, an apostle to the nations, he went to the nations where they were not God's people. But because of his preaching, then they became God's people and children of the living God. Now back to Romans. Verse 27, chapter 9, 27. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Interesting. Israel will be as the sand of the sea, but only a remnant of them will be saved. And then remember from the beginning of this chapter, Paul says, Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So Israel has descendants as the sand of the sea, but only a remnant of them will be saved. Verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursue, pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Well, of course, this is speaking of Jesus. Jesus is the stumbling stone, but he's also a stumbling stone to many who say they believe in him. Now, how can that be? That can be if we 
pursue righteousness as if it is by obedience to the law. If we have a strict list of do's and don'ts, we say, oh, I made it. I, I did all these things. You know, and you have your outline. Well, you might have had 10 things or 20 or 30, but you didn't have 10,000 things that are also matters of the heart that you failed at. So even we Christians can stumble over the stumbling stone because we think we're good enough, especially after we get saved, right? I'm better than you. I, Jesus is my Lord, and I repented of my sins that I knew of at that time, and here I am. I'm better than you. I'm a Christian. Well, no. No. We don't get in because we're better than them. I don't get in because I'm better than you. You don't get in because you're better than me. If we think like that, we stumble over the stumbling stone. There's only one way in. And that's what separates Christianity from every religion on earth. There's only one way in. Every other religion stumbles over the stumbling stone. Oh, they all say Jesus is a great teacher. But they don't say he's the only way in. We will be held accountable for every word we say, every act we do, at the judgment seat of Christ. Are we going to be perfect in all of our works and all of our words? How do we make it past the judgment seat? Lord, I trust in you. I didn't make it on my own effort. I only can make it because of you. Romans 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, the English Standard Version uses the word the end of the law, and so do other versions, but the meaning is the goal of the law. People will use this verse by focusing on the word end to say that the law is therefore irrelevant. No, the law is a tutor that always leads us to Christ. If I get into a bad attitude and begin to sin, the law will convict me as a sinner and lead me back to Christ. It's a tutor leading us to Christ. Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down. And do not say who will descend into the abyss, which is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? It says the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if, we confess with, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, 
bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, where did that scripture come from that I just quoted? Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. And then there was a quote. This is verses 5, 6, 7, 8 in chapter 10 of Romans. Well, it comes from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting with verse 11. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. It is in your heart so that you can do it. These people of Israel, they saw the acts of God, but Moses understood the ways of God. And then verse 15 here says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of I am your God, that I command you today by loving I am your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And I am your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that I am swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. So Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, wrote this. Verse 14, chapter 10. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in whom... In him of whom they have never heard. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Interesting, he says in verse 16, 16, they have not all obeyed the gospel. He is still talking about the Israelites, the Jews. And the gospel even though they didn't see it, the gospel was preached even to them, even in the Old Testament times. Moses lived according to the gospel of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. That is 
quote from Psalm 19, verse 4, speaking of how the constellations in the heavens proclaim the entire gospel of God. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So now Paul is beginning to make a distinction between New Testament believers and the Old Testament believers, the Old Testament Israelites. And he will talk more about this as we get into chapter 11 now. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? God says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee, the knee to Baal. So this is the remnant. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. The elect who? The elect Israelites. There were elect Israelites. Not all of Israel fell away and not all of Israel fell into sin and debauchery. What does Paul just say here? There were 7,000 men that God preserved to himself who did not worship Baal. So these are the elect who obtained what? Salvation. Who and this salvation we're talking about here is the, the placement as a son. Now this quotation in 11, chapter 7, now I'm going to my trusty ESV reference Bible. And that one, chapter 8, or verse 8, takes me to Isaiah 29, verse 10. So, Isaiah 29, verse 10. I think there's something here I want to share. That's why I'm, I wanted to look that up. Okay, we'll read Isaiah 29, 9, and 10. Astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. For I am has poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and covered your heads, the seers. Now this verse 10 is what um, 
the English Standard Version references to what we just read in the book of Romans, chapter 11. I am as poured out upon you a spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and covered your heads, the seers. In other words, he has stopped the prophetic word from coming to these people. And why? As I read this verse in Isaiah 29, it reminded me of Isaiah 28 that begins like this. Ah, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. Ephraim was the leading tribe of the northern kingdom of Israel. They were the ones, they and all the other northern tribes, were the ones displaced by Assyria. And that's what the book of Hosea is about. It describes their sin. They were even doing child sacrifice to Baal. And at the beginning of Hosea, Hosea was told to marry a harlot and then God used those children prophetically to describe what he was going to do with Israel. Then in, later on in chapter 28 of Isaiah, verse 7, starting at 7, These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed by wine they stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. Okay. <clears throat> well, most people, when they read that, they think they're getting drunk as they uh, carry on their priestly duties. They, they may well have been, but the meaning is they are drunk upon false doctrine, false teaching, serving false idols. Because look at chapter 29, verse 9 again. Astonish yourselves and be astonished. Blind yourselves and be blind. Be drunk, but not with wine. Stagger, but not with strong drink. Okay. So these people in chapter 28 uses the same language. Verse 7, These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. For all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. The table is the place of fellowship. The table of communion is the place where we share the word of God. The bread of the presence was put into the holy place of the temple and in the holy place of the tabernacle of Moses. And it represented communion with God. The bread of the presence, panim is the Hebrew word, means face, sitting face to face with God, communing with God face to face, sharing his bread. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then I'm going to read 9 and 10 from Isaiah 28 because this is so important. To whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? God, who will God, to whom will God teach? To whom will he explain? Then the answer is this. There's a question mark here in the ESV, which is incorrect because he answers his own question. He says, those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast, that's who he will teach knowledge, that's to whom he will explain the word. Now, 
I'm going to take you now to Hebrews chapter 5. See, all of the word of God is a seamless garment. It all works together. And that's why you have to stay in the word and wash yourself with the word so that you can begin to comprehend what the word of God is even saying. The word of God is written, so to speak, in code. And that's to keep the defiled from understanding it. Hebrews chapter 5, starting with verse 11. Just before that, the writer is starting to talk about Melchizedek, the high priesthood of Melchizedek. And then he says about this, about Melchizedek, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. You, Christians, have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the teaching about righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. This is our calling. This is what God expects of us, is to be able to discern between good and evil and to choose the good. And so, going back down, uh, back to Isaiah 28, verse 9. To whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? The answer is to those who are weaned from the milk, to those who are taken from the breast. If you're still drinking the milk, if you're still sucking on the breast of a teacher for everything that you get from the Word of God, you cannot get knowledge for yourself. You have to be weaned from the milk to do that. Verse 10, for it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. How do I know what I know? By approaching it precept upon precept line upon line, here a little, there a little. This particular teaching that I'm doing right now, I intended to do over a week ago. But I realized in reading, reading these chapters 9, 10, and 11 over and over again that I just wasn't getting it. I just was not understanding it. And I just want to uh, say this because some of you will have bought the book I recommended a video or two ago called The Witness of the Stars by E.W. Bullinger. And in his discussion of Pisces, he makes a, a really serious error with respect to identity of um, the Bride of Christ. He consigns it to the um, ancient Jews, to the to Old Testament Israel, and um, he just makes a huge error. And I think part of the reason why is because he did not understand Hebrews nine ten and eleven. And it's interesting that the verse that he used when he began his book was the one quoted in chapter ten from Psalm 19, verse 4. I found that very interesting. So now back to the book of Romans. And we're going to start now in uh, chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 11. <clears throat> Well, I didn't read 9 and 10. Uh, I'll back, go back and read 7 too. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it. In other words, there were elect Jews, but the rest were hardened. 
As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear. Down to this very day, and that's what came out of Isaiah 29, verse 10. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Their table, see, that's their, their table is where they teach. Their food, the food that they offer is tainted food. It's filthy. It's covered with vomit, according to Isaiah 28. So the food that they taught, all of ancient Israel and then the Jews also, their table, their teaching became a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Verse 11, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. <laughs> oh, really? Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So it was because the Jews rejected Christ and persecuted the apostles and the early believers that the message went on out into the world to the Gentiles. So that's how God got the word out to the other nations. Verse 13, Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, and as much as, as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, to the nations, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. The root, of course, is Jesus. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, olive tree do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Branches were broken off. See, that's referring to the Jews and the Israelites. They were all broken off so that the nations could be grafted in. That is true, Paul says. They were broken off because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. Here's this word again. We're to walk by faith and have an obedience that comes through faith. But yes, yet there's this idea of fear involved. And remember a scripture, Philippians chapter 2. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Speaking of the salvation of our soul, our spirits are saved by what Jesus did has done, but we have to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. See, here's one of those classic verses, not once saved, always saved. But it's not talking about the salvation of your spirit. It's dealing with the salvation of your soul Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. Well, how do we, how do we get cut off? By despising our birthright, 
by becoming like Esau. That's how we'll get cut off. And how do we despise our birthright? By stumbling over the stumbling stone. And how do we do that? By by believing that we can make it based upon our own efforts. Number one. And number two, by despising the word of God that shows us how we're to live. Because if we take the word of God and say that the word teaches us that we can do whatever we want to, that we don't have to live in a way that is holy before God, we despise our birthright. Without holiness, no one will see God. So we despise our birthright if we despise the teaching of the Word of God. We don't make it because we do everything perfectly. But as Paul teaches us in chapter 8, just before these three verses, these three chapters, we have to live according to the Spirit instead of according to the flesh. Because if we set our mind upon the things of the flesh, we will die. But if we set our minds upon the things of the Spirit, we will live. If we put to death the sinful deeds of the body, by the Spirit of God, we will live. If we indulge in the sinful deeds of the body, we will die. We cannot live a life of feeding our flesh, our sinful flesh, with sinful things. That's how we despise our birthright. And Paul warns, Chapter 11, verse 22. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. In other words, provided you continue to obey by faith. Otherwise, you too will be cut off because you will have despised your birthright. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial, hardening, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. I believe we are right about at the last day of the fullness of the Gentiles. So that time, we are at that time. And the partial hardening came upon Israel until this time. And the scriptures teach that once that partial hardening ceases, then there's going to be a reconciliation between the Jews and the Gentiles, because the Jews are going to then come into the full faith in Jesus Christ. But then, verse 26, And in this way, all Israel will be saved. 
all Israel will be saved in this way. So there's a hardening that's gone on for 2,000 years. And yet when the fullness of the Gentiles happens and the partial hardening upon Israel ceases so that they now believe, then all Israel will be saved. Didn't we miss a lot of Israel? But what does that mean? What does it mean all Israel will be saved? Clearly it's not talking about all of the natural descendants of Israel, is it? How could it be? Let's go back to chapter 9, verse 6. Paul says, For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Well, who does belong to Israel? Do you remember when Jacob received his new name? I think it was in um, Genesis 32 or 33. 32. In chapter 32... Jacob wrestles with the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord says to him, in um, verse 26, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Then... He said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob, as if he didn't know his name. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. You have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And here in the notes, it says, Israel means he strives with God. He strives with God. Do you strive with God? Do you strive with men? In our walk, it's not an easy walk. There's this this tension of walking in faith <clears throat> and obedience and doing the obedience by faith and not under the law and then us also having expectations of God, expectations of men and so on. It, this is our walk. And so there is a group of people that God named Israel, the group that really seeks to be blessed by God, that really wants to become a son of God, that does not want to despise their birthright. Are you one of those? That's how we strive with God. We're always seeking to know Him better. We're always seeking to see Him face to face. We're always disappointed that we don't see Him face to face. We're disappointed in others that don't want to see Jesus face to face. And so Paul, he goes through these chapters, these three chapters
in order to finally get to the point, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 are like three chapters of mystery, and what in the world is Paul getting at? He's talking about the overcomers. He's talking about the elect. He's talking about the Kodeshim. He's talking about the overcomers of God and how do they become overcomers. Well, let's find out. Revelation chapter 12. Verse 11. Well, verse 10 says that the ancient serpent, the deceiver of the whole world, is cast down to the earth. And then verse 11 says, And they have overcome him, the dragon, the accuser, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony and we love not our lives even unto death. Which is what Jesus said. He who saves his life, that is, he who saves his carnal life loses it. He who loses his carnal life saves it. So the overcomer overcomes by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony is the word of obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you will reveal your word to us who diligently seek your face. I thank you that you have hidden your word from deceivers and from those who do not love you and your ways, your truth, your righteousness, your holiness. And thank you for revealing these truths to us. We look forward to your soon coming and we pray that we will be found worthy to escape all that is coming upon the earth. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.